In New York, everyone is always voicing opinions, and often the only players who get noticed are the ones with a mouth big enough to be heard above the commotion. But during the 1980s, Mark Bavaro managed to take a bite out of the Big Apple by hardly ever opening his mouth. I tell you, he's a stone face, that Bavaro now. You know what the hell he's thinking. I'd hate to have to fight that son of a gun. Bavaro intimidated his coaches with his brooding silence and overpowered his opponents with raw determination. His play on the field spoke volumes, but off it, he epitomized the strong, silent type. How come, when you were playing, that you never did any kind of interviews? Uh, basically, I didn't have really anything to say. But how about if they wanted to know how you felt during a certain play, or how you... Uh, it's none of their business. Uh, one other... Two questions in, and it seemed apparent that I wasn't going to get anywhere with that line of questioning. Um. But when we switched topics and started talking about football and family, Bavaro opened up. My inspiration in life has, has always been my father and, and my grandfathers. Both my grandfathers were immigrants from Italy. They were good, tough men. My grandfather on my mother's side, he had no idea what I was doing. I would bring him posters. i say, hey, Pop, I'm you know, making a lot of money. And he could barely speak English, but he would say, hey, you know, go learn how to fix a TV. You can give me a screwdriver. When you know how to fix that TV, I'll respect you. Or go get a job with the city. I said, all right. I saw them sacrifice for their kids. So, I mean, I saw the daily routine that they go through, you know, day after day, going to the same job, doing the same thing for no money. They never complain. My father, he was a school teacher for like 40 years. He was drafted by the 49ers out of Holy Cross. And he blew his knee out. But with your dad being a former player, he must have been pretty critical of you then. I mean, he must have been... No. He wasn't? No. No, my father was a great guy. He was kind of like a frustrated athlete, but he never put any pressure on us. He just kind of left me alone and let me grow the way I was going to grow. I would come home, great game, you're the best player out there. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, by far. I said, all right, you know, and so I, was, I just believed in myself. I just thought I was a good player. Even though in the back of my mind, I, I knew I wasn't. You know, I, I did it for him mostly, you know, because I knew it was bringing him joy. Passed away uh, just three years ago. Was your dad at the Super Bowl? Yeah, he was at both Super Bowls. What did he say to you after the, the games? Do you remember talking to him after the games? Uh, nice game. You know, I'm going off a cigarette. <laughs> When Bavaro joined the Giants, his head coach became a father figure. Just like Bavaro's real dad, Bill Parcells understood that his stoic tight end responded best to positive reinforcement. Mark was a very well-motivated player. He really was. He wasn't a guy that you had to stay on. He was somewhat reserved. I wouldn't say introverted. As I got to know him over the years, we always communicated pretty well. That's a good catch, Mark. Big play, son. That's the way to go. Hey, those guys are going to beat you around. you got to learn to beat their hands off you. You know what I mean? My rookie year probably paid me the best compliment I've ever received in my career. He passed me on the and he says, Nice catch, kid. And then he says, and you know what? I go, what, coach? He goes, you look good doing it. And that's all I needed to hear. Bavaro became the Giants' most versatile offensive weapon. He could dominate at the point of attack on one play, then beat you as a pass receiver the next. That flexibility enabled Parcells to play the smash mouth style New York became famous for. And when Bavaro was the one getting smashed in the mouth, he showed a threshold for pain as impressive as his physical talent. In 1986 against the Saints, Bavaro broke his jaw and had several teeth knocked out. He returned with his mouth wired shut and scored a touchdown and a come from behind win. Playing with pain, was all part of being a giant. If you didn't play with, with injuries, I mean, they considered you a... I'm, a, I'm trying to think a of another failure. word for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you were one of those. I mean, you were not 
the kind of guys that they wanted to play with. You had to prove yourself. The Giants were known for their defense. And they ran the team. And if you were going to be an offensive player on their team, you know, they wanted somebody who was like them. Because I used to think that no matter who I was playing against, I was always tough of them. If it ever came down to a fight in the pocket lot, I feel good about my chances with anybody. During a Monday night game in 1986, Bavaro cemented his status as one of the NFL's toughest players. New York trailed San Francisco 17 to nothing at halftime. With NFC supremacy at stake, Bavaro carried half the Niners' defense, including Hall of Famer Ronnie Lott, number 42, on his back. The number one play we put in every year at training camp was that exact play. It's, you know, it was nothing. Threw it over the middle to him, and I remember standing there going, okay, wow, okay, whoa, whoa. It really did something to the team, and it really was probably the signature play of the whole football season. Inspired by Bavaro's effort, New York came back to beat San Francisco and eventually went on to win Super Bowl XXI. Bavaro's popularity was at its peak but he still did his best to remain anonymous. We had won Super Bowl in 86, and I had a friend um, who lived in a town where Mark lived in New Jersey. During Lent, Mark used to go to Mass at 6 a.m. Mark would stand in the back. He's got on tattered jeans and a Celtics tank top. He had that long, wild hair, three, four days worth of growth. Could care less about his appearance. This friend of mine's mother would go to that Mass, and she came home and told her son, there's a gentleman that comes to Mass every day, and we all got together and we said a prayer that he would find a job. Well, that young man was Mark Bovaro. They had no clue. They just thought it was some guy out on the street, a homeless guy, that just came to Mass every day because they had nothing else to do. And there's Mark Bovaro, who was, you know, had gone to the Pro Bowl and you know, scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl, but you know, that was his personality. That was his persona. In order to, to be the best at your profession, at the top of your profession like you were, you have to have a clear knowledge of your own shortcomings. What were they? I knew I was probably the best tight end out there, but yet feeling so insecure about what I was about to do. A lot of people say, you know, go out there and kill, you know, kill, kill, kill. And I was just like, man, go out there and survive. People say, you know, don't be scared. Who's scared? And I was like, oh, I'm scared especially when I cut the football and everybody's attention would turn to you. I'm now the object of everybody's wrath right now. Mm -hmm. You better run. But Mark, how does that jive with what you said earlier when you said it's like the John L. Sullivan thing where I can, I can whip any man in the house, which you said that was when you lined up against the guy, you felt that if, it, if both of you had to go out in the back alley that you were going to be the one that was going to come out. And now you're saying that when you got the ball, you got, you got scared. Yeah, I'm a very complex person. <laughs> I got a lot, a lot of different emotions running through my head at any one given time. Making sense of Bavaro's conflicting emotions can be difficult, but you always knew exactly where he stood when it came time to play his biggest rival. I hated the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, that's not even a question. They were evil, incarnate. Especially Buddy Ryan. I, I, I dreamed of murdering him. And I actually I went to confession one time. I said, Father, if I have a chance to hurt him on the sideline tomorrow, I said, I'm going to do it. Is that wrong? <laughs> he said, no. He goes, no, 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 son. He goes, hey, just aim for the knees. No. <laughs> no. Why was that? Why, why Buddy Ryan? Because he was, a, he was an Yeah. He, he was a bad person. Mm -hmm. You remember the whole bounty thing. I know he was telling those guys to go out and hurt anybody who, who he thought was a good player. They were assassins. Ironically, Bavaro finished his career with a team he despised most. But I'll always remember him as a giant. In a sense, he was just like his father and grandfathers, a blue-collar employee who relished giving an honest day's work. My favorite part of football was a couple of hours after the game, when I could sit back and say, this is what I've done. I'm exhausted, I'm hurt, and I got ice bags all over me. You know, I love this game. I'm glad I got the chance to interview Mark Bavaro because it turns out he had plenty to say. Fittingly, when I asked him to describe himself, the man known for saying so little only needed a single word. Tough. Yeah, 
he's not going to back down. He's going to he's going to be there when the tough times come, and we can count on him. He's reliable, tough and reliable. How you doing, kid? Right. Oh, boy. I'm proud of you. Tough guy, kid. Any coach would like to have a player like that. You never forget them, and they're always part of you forever.